So my lab is really focused on understanding what's going on in the brain in depression. Um, although we have a number of therapeutics to treat depression, they don't actually work in everyone. And for some individuals, they don't have long-term effects. So we really want to, need to understand what's happening in the brain to treat these symptoms of depression, like hopelessness, um, loss of energy, loss of motivation, loss of pleasure, um, to really help those individuals that aren't responding to current therapeutics. Um, so the brain is not a homogeneous structure, as you've heard from these previous um, speakers. It's composed, composed of multiple brain regions that connect to each other to form multiple um, um, circuits in the brain. So the goal of our lab is to really find the vulnerable neuronal populations in depression, figure out what's going wrong with them, and try to fix them so we can improve these depression symptomatology behaviors. And we, I'm a basic scientist, so I don't work in humans, I work in mice, because we have a lot of great tools that allow us to dissect out these circuits and these cell subtypes um, using these different types of mouse lines. Um, so we use a preclinical model of depression, um, and, you, you know, you can't simply ask a mouse how it feels, right? So we actually have to stress a mouse. We have to put them through a stress paradigm and then assess behaviors that are representative to depression sy symptomatology that we see in humans. Um, so we use this bully stress paradigm, and you can see this, this larger mouse is antagonizing this smaller mouse here. And this goes on for repeated days, and it's a very stressful situation for this experimental mouse. And one of the behaviors we do is social interaction. So how this works is we put the experimental mouse in a box, and you can see that there's, a, there's another mouse hanging out here. So this is a new mouse that they've never seen before. Um, and you can see these traces here are just the movement of the experimental mouse. So this is a non-stressed animal, and what you see is this non-stressed animal is spending a lot of time interacting with this novel mouse because it's, they, 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 they like interacting with it. It's very rewarding to them. However, the animals that undergo this stress, you can see that they're actively avoiding this novel mouse. They no longer want to interact with that mouse. So they have this social avoid avoidance behavior. They also have what's called anhedonia, which is a simply the loss of pleasure. And the way that we, um, we look at anhedonia in rodents is we give them a choice between a sugar, sugar water or regular water. And a normal, non-stressed animal is going to want that sugar water, right? Because it tastes good, it makes them feel good, it's rewarding. Whereas our stressed animals actually don't really have a preference for the sugar water or the regular water. So they have this anhedonia loss of pleasure. Um, so this is just a slice of a mouse brain um, showing the area that we actually study, this area here called the nucleus accumbens. And this is a brain region that's really important for motivation and, and reward and, and pleasure. And this, we know this brain region becomes dysfunctional in diseases that affect motivation or pleasure, such as depression. Um, this particular mouse line we have, we're actually able to label different populations of cells. You see them here in red and green. Um, and these are the cells that my lab studies. And these are cells that actually send information to other brain regions because they send their axons out to other brain regions. You can see, see their green and their red axons here. And so what we actually found when we stressed these animals is that this red-labeled neuronal population was actually vulnerable to stress. So here's the, the, what this, this red population looks like in a non-stressed animal. You can see that they have this really extensive dendritic architecture. Um, and this is just their electrical activity. This is just showing this, this um, line here just is representative of a neuron firing. So that's just their basic electrical activity. But when we stress the animals, what we actually see is the dendritic ar architecture is dramatically shrinking. And as a consequence of that, we think we have this um, um, maladaptive electrical activity. So you see this increased electrical activity in these neurons. Um, so we really want to understand how is this happening in these neurons? What are the actual molecules that are leading to these changes in these um, vulnerable neuron populations? And try to target those molecules to reverse these changes and ultimately cause antidepressant behavior. <coughs> 
So I think what you heard from the first speaker is the brain is very heterogeneous. In one region, you can have multiple neuron subtypes. So these stars right here just represent a bunch of different subtypes in one brain region. But we have tools that allow us to isolate our, par our particular neuron population. So we're actually able to isolate this vulnerable neuron population, and we're actually able to look at RNA levels in this vulnerable population to see what genes are being turned on and being expressed. And that's allowed us to find some candidate molecules. So the molecule we actually found is called EGR3. I'll get to what EGR3 is in a little bit, but when we actually look at levels of EGR3 in the vulnerable neuron population, we can see that it's much higher in the stressed animals compared to non-stressed. Um, so we actually have really nice genetic tools in rodents that allow us to specifically go into the nucleus accumbens and genetically reduce EGR3 levels in this vulnerable neuron population. And what happens when we reduce EGR levels in that specific um, population is you can see that we've prevented that social um, avoidance because the animal, the stress animal, this animal received the same amount of stress as this animal, um, except this animal has reduced EGR3 levels in that neuron population. And they're interacting quite a bit with this, this novel social mouse. Um, we've, also be able to, we've also been able to prevent the anhedonia when we reduce EGR3 levels. Um, and we can, destroy, we can restore this dendritic architecture, and we can dampen this aberrant electrical activity. So one caveat is we can't actually pharmacologically target EGR3. But what we can do is find molecules that are downstream of our EGR3 and try to target um, those molecules. So let me tell you a bit about what EGR3 actually does. It's actually a transcription factor, and these are molecules that hang out in the nucleus of the cell where the DNA is, and they bind to the DNA, and they cause the DNA to be transcribed into mRNA, and that's ultimately transcribed into protein, and it's the protein that carries out the functions in the cells. So we wanted to see, well, is EGR3 actually causing an induction of molecules that are actually involved with the dendritic architecture? And we actually did find a molecule that is, that is regulating this molecule called Rho A. And when we actually go in, and this, sorry, this Rho A molecule has been shown before um, in neurons. If you have high levels of Rho A, you actually have reduced dendritic arbors or architecture. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing in the stressed animals. Um, so when we actually went in and look at EGR3 levels in this vulnerable population, we do see that it's incre the, the Rho A levels are increased in the stressed animals. So the really nice thing about Rho A is we can actually pharmacologically target it. We can also pharmacologically tar target molecules that interact with Rho A to cause these dendritic changes. So really the goal of this award is to take our depressed, stressed animals, and use these row pathway pharmacological treatments to see if we can cause antidepressant behaviors, see if we can stabilize this dendritic architecture, and then ultimately stabilize this electrical activity. So we actually have some pretty promising data. We've used a row A inhibitor. Um, if you see a stressed animal that receives a placebo injection, they're still avoiding this novel mouse. But when we give the animal the Roe inhibitor during stress, we can actually um, prevent that social avoidance. So the goal is to continue to test this Roe molecule and other molecules that affect that pathway to see if we can, we can reverse these behaviors and these changes that are occurring in these neurons. So first and foremost, I want to thank the people in my lab, because they're the ones that are actually in there doing the experiments. I want to specifically um, thank Chase Francis, who's a very talented graduate student, and he just received his PhD three weeks ago. So he's really the one that drove this project that led to us finding this EGR3 and this Rho A molecule. I also want to thank Ramesh Chandra, because he's a really talented molecular biologist in the lab. He's done a lot of these studies um, to analyze these, these um, levels of these molecules. And thank everyone else in the lab that participated in this, and also the Staglin family and Imro and Jansen for funding this award.